Uh, now where were we? Any questions? <laughs> it's like a, a a big version of the miniature version that most of us have gone through, isn't it? Like mm. when you went to the Salvation Army Bible College, you got the Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit when mm. you got sure baptized the in the Holy Spirit, mm. and then charismatically <coughs> you went through all of that. And yeah. then, you know, so yeah. it's, that's the shorter <coughs> version of the big version, if yeah. you like. <coughs> yeah. When I came to peace, basically we led peace through that all in a few years. That was what Phil Pringle came. He was surprised it was such a fast work. And so basically, I led the church into we call it, would have called it charismatic experience. But it was Pentecostal experience, baptism of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, freedom in worship, healing, miracles. It doesn't matter whether you call it Pentecostal and charismatic. The real difference between the two is this. Pentecostals developed some very hard-nosed doctrines. And one of them was tongues is the initial evidence that you have been baptised in the Holy Spirit. If you haven't spoken in tongues, you have not been baptised in the Holy Spirit. This just doesn't stand up. It doesn't stand up biblically, and it doesn't stand up in the experience of Christians. Quite often, the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been given to people with huge power, but they didn't speak in tongues, either because they didn't know about it, uh, or for some other reason, they just couldn't seem to free themselves up, and yet they'd free up in healing. They'd free up in prophecy. We've, we've all seen experiences of it. And the Salvation Army, for example, 50 years before Azusa Street believed and publicly taught what they called the mighty Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they never even knew tongues, healing, prophecy existed, didn't believe in it. But they would wait on the Lord in all-night prayer meetings. The power, the power of God would fall on them and give them huge power to win souls and live holy lives. They did astoundingly with the power of God, brought millions to Christ, all in the space of a few years. No, they had a mighty Pentecostal baptism of the Spirit. But even today, in charismatic times, there are people who, who get mighty baptisms of the Spirit. But tongues is not the initial sign. And some people get baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it's only as their faith gets released that they speak in tongues later. So it, it was a very rigid doctrine and a very unhelpful doctrine and it and made the Pentecostal doctrine quite unacceptable to people who had a better understanding of Scripture. Yet yeah, when I became a Baptist pastor, uh, and because the Baptist theology on this was you, get, you receive the Holy Spirit when you're born again. Now that's true. There's a truth in that. But it doesn't mean there isn't much more to receive. And, uh, and, and so I was, I was easily able to, to my Baptist superiors, because they would query me on this, I was easy, easily able to coordinate these two streams of thought, that there is a baptism of the Spirit, every Christian should have it. How do you, how do you make that harmonious with a doctrine that says, no, you get the Holy Spirit when you're born again, otherwise you're not born again? You can, and you can biblically. And I used to explain, but when you're born again, you have the ownership rights to it all. So biblically, yes, you have it. You own it. Your name's on it. But it's like having money in the bank you haven't spent. And that, that it's, it's the job of every Christian to so seek the Lord that you come into the full experience of what is your actual inheritance right as a son. And this is why many people experience the baptism of the Spirit later. They get hungry for God and they break through. It's not hard to harmonize these doctrines, but you've, you've got to have... Um, you know, hard to do so and not have these exclusive and uh, and hard positions. Anyway, um, there you go.